Okay, we are here for the Open Man project with uh, Jean-Claude Guedon from the University of Montreal. Um, so, uh, it's a very short interview and um, could you please introduce uh, very briefly yourself? Well, specifically I am a historian of science by training but got uh, diverted, we might say, into areas such as internet culture and digital humanities and electronic publishing. And I found myself since the year 90s deeply involved with the open access uh, movement. Now it's a movement. Originally it was just a few, a few individuals. Uh, and I'm still working on those issues uh, nowadays. And since you are uh, very active in the open access movement, uh, do you have in mind uh, any uh, initiative or uh, idea that could be useful uh, for the open access to educational resources uh, movement? Well, the, the problem of uh, open access for educational resources is, of course, specific to the domain. It's a bit different from open access to uh, scientific papers, journals, and, and the like. I, although in either case, one could be, both of these situations could be conceived and construed as being no more than work on what you might call the needed infrastructure to, in one case, do good research, in the other case, do good teaching. So uh, the open access dimension of the, uh, of the educational resources is, is indeed extremely important, especially when you are in a situation which again mirrors that of scientific publishing. The publishers of, of textbooks tend to take advantage of a captive audience to of course create books with very high prices and then they shift them by very little every year and have a new edition and then encourage the professors to use the latest edition, which means even the secondary book business is not working very efficiently. So the students are being penalized by that. But they're penalized in another way too, which is that you find yourself with this system into again a, a buyer-consumer or seller-consumer kind of situation. Publishers sell textbooks, professors tell the students to buy textbooks and then everybody tries to fit within what the textbooks do, both professors and students. With open educational resources, you can not only have hopefully very cheap or free uh, 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 textbooks, but you can also imagine new ways of producing those textbooks. For example, uh, there are communities of mathematicians, math, math teachers in, uh, in France that have gone banded together and have created textbooks for various levels of the lycée in France uh, where uh, these textbooks reflect the, the demands of the national educational system yet at the same time reflect also the, the deep knowledge of the uh, real situation of teaching in the classroom by, by teachers and these textbooks are sometimes produced by a community of 200, 300 professors working in a distributed manner, correcting each other and making in the end much better textbooks than what you can have with uh, just two, three or four authors. So you have this, uh, this sort of situation. And that sort of situation appears to me to be particularly important for developing and emerging nations because they have some teachers, of course, they know the conditions in which they are working much better than someone who is producing a textbook in New York or in London. And, and they, uh, they know uh, how to really target the, their audiences at the right level. And they have a product they can modify themselves. You're in effect in the same situation as you are with free software. You're in a position of developing uh, tools which can be adapted, improved, uh, tweaked in order uh, to, to respond to new demands, to uh, perceived flaws or small uh, improvements that you can do to the product. Now, all these are, to me, uh, seem to be obvious advantages to that. And at the same time, we have uh, the result, which is accessibility again. The thing being either very free in digital format or cheap when it is printed and published often on demand. Uh, you use something like an espresso machine and you can produce these books for a very, very uh, low price. Uh, you render the financial accessibility of these tools uh, much, much greater and that's only for the benefit of the teaching enterprise. 
very interesting. And um, so, in the in the ambit of the open land projects, uh, some countries from the MENA region, uh, medium east and north, north Africa, they are developing together with European. Uh, countries a strategy and a roadmap for creating uh, an infrastructure for open um, educational resources. So um, the, the next question is, is if you have any practical recommendation to, to, for such an endeavor that those countries uh, started. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm delighted to hear that because I've long said that there are two world regions at least, there are maybe three with the Chinese, but uh, that uh, can rely on the uh, on the common language from many, many people. The Arabic world, where everybody reads Arabic, those who can read, read Arabic from, you know, the, the Gulf all the way to Morocco, and, um, and the Spanish-speaking world, of course, in Latin America, where, again, you have this situation of uh, uh, a, a large audience open by a common language. So that, to take advantage of that is very, very good idea. Now, in terms of how to organize oneself, it seems to me that they have to take into account, of course, the requir various requirements of their uh, various educational ministries or uh, local r rules about how to teach. Some countries are very centralized, some are less centralized. I suspect in the Arabic countries, centralization is quite common, but it's not the same kind of centralization centralization in Tunisia or in Egypt, you know, you, you have to think about those things. So it might be as a first term to try and create a, a kind of common database uh, of all the topics they want to, to cover and then they could take, pick and, uh, and organize according to their needs a subset of that uh, general database and create the, the kinds of tools, the kinds of textbooks, the kinds of uh, teaching tools that uh, uh, correspond to the needs of their educational uh, laws, uh, systems, uh, demands and issues. So that you can take advantage of economies of scale on the one hand and yet respond to specific local needs. And then you can, according to the topics, of course, you have to organize the distribution of, of, of work differently. If you deal with a topic, and I would suggest starting there, if you deal with topics which are essentially do not harbor much contentious uh, matter, such as mathematics or physics or chemistry, uh, then you, you just see what the programs are like in each country. We do the superset of all the programs and then everybody picks and chooses. Um, but if you go into areas like history or sociology or you know, even biology with the question of Darwinism and religion, then it's going to be trickier and that has to be negotiated uh, accordingly in each section. But these problems are not really problems of open educational resources. They are problems of international collaboration in the area of education. Open education, uh, educational resources will meet these problems. They have to know how to solve them, but they won't be, they won't be uh, new problems. They are well-known problems in, in, re in this regard. Otherwise, uh, especially in domains like mathematics and, and, uh, and physics and chemistry, you let the people starting to contribute the, to the various parts, chapters, sections, and everything that can be done. And then people can pick and choose all these things. There used to be a, a really interesting program in, um, in uh, I think it was at Rice University in, uh, in the United States, which was called Connection. And what they had uh, really tried to organize was a modular vision of every textbook so that you could even connect parts of one textbook from one discipline to parts of a textbook from another discipline to organize interdisciplinary textbooks when topics like that were being considered to be important. And that, that might be a, a kind of second step, a sort of intellectual interoperability principle that could be overlaid uh, on, on top of the of the system of uh, producing uh, open educational resources. Very clear and interesting. And for such interoperability, open access oh, is, well, it's, is it's, a must. It's a must. Without it, you'll never get it, of course. I mean, each company would then start developing its own modular elements and ensure that they're not compatible with somebody <laughs> else. <laughs> That's quite clear, yeah.
So thanks a lot uh, to Jean-Claude Guédon for, for, uh, for this interview. <laughs> Quite welcome. Thank you very much for the privilege. <laughs>